Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmen McFarlane, and I'm here to talk a little bit about how to build an engaging um, craft beer school program for your brewery and for your staff and for um, your customers. Uh, like I said, my name is Carmen, and I am the creative and marketing chair for the Phoenix Brewing Company in Mansfield, Ohio. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for being here live. And if you are watching on replay, thank you for watching on replay. Um, thank you to Andrew and the Craft Beer Professionals team for everything they're doing to advance and promote craft beer and to make it such a positive and encouraging uh, place to be. Uh, before we start, take a second and make sure that you have a beverage, a pen, pencil, paper. Um, beverage can be a beer, can be whatever you want it to be, but go ahead and grab that. And uh, I'll give you a second to do that because everybody needs something in their hand or something to work with to, to be just a little more engaged, especially with an online presentation. So go ahead and grab those items. I'll give you a second. So before jumping into the craft beer industry, I spent 20 years in education. I was um, a visual arts teacher uh, and I taught seventh grade and also, or excuse me, middle school for seven years. And then I also taught high school for an additional 13. Um, during those 20 years, I served on many curriculum writing committees. I designed the curriculum for my advanced level courses. Um, I served in regional leadership positions in public relations advocacy, and also as the co-regional director for the North Central Ohio, Ohio Arts Education Association. And I did various positions over the course of 10 years uh, for them. Um, I served, um, I was one of five secondary educators chosen to help to rewrite the visual arts standards by the Ohio Department of Education in 2012. I also was a writer for the Ohio Arts Assessment Collaborative with Patel for Education. Um, and the Ohio Arts Council. I've adjudicated many art shows and I was also awarded the Outstanding Art Teacher Award for North Central Ohio. Um, and also as a statewide award for as advocates for arts education and advocacy. I did a lot of ad advocacy for my program at the local and the state level. And that's actually where my interest in marketing and communications began. And, um, uh, I really got my start with education. Uh, arts education, as many of you know, is a field that most people really have to fight to keep a program alive. So I had to market to my my community, my administration, uh, my building, and mainly to my students because you had to have them sign up since it was an elective course. And eventually all of that led to what I do and what I love now. So thank you for being here. Uh, right now I am the director of social engagement for um, the Phoenix Brewing Company. I'm a member of the Pink, whoops, so sorry, member of the Pink Boots Society since 2016, founder of the Jane Doe's uh, Craft Beer Consortium in Mansfield, which is um, a women's beer group. I'm also the marketing committee chair. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my slides. Founder of the Jane Doe's Craft Beer Consortium, which is a women's beer group. Um, Goodness, goodness. Uh, I serve on the board for the Ohio Creppers Association, and I'm also a Cicerone program certified beer server, and I'm studying to become a certified Cicerone. I love the opportunity to share craft beer experiences with um, other craft beer lovers. The purpose of craft beer school, if you're thinking to yourself, um, you know, why is craft beer school important? It may be that because you feel it's a monetary um bonus for your business because, you know, it's going to bring in some money by having people come in to pay to learn about craft beer. It may be that you feel that it's important for your staff to have that basic knowledge or to, you know, understand beer a little bit better. But really, you know, in general, and it goes for both both staff and for your customers, the purpose of craft beer is to develop craft beer literacy. If a craft beer school is to develop craft beer literacy. Craft beer literacy is the ability to describe, evaluate, and discuss craft beers. A beer literate individual, they can describe, evaluate, and discuss beer. They can talk about beer. They are both a consumer and they are on the contrib a contributor to craft beer culture. And a contributor is not just a brewer. It's also someone who is an advocate, someone who is um, interested in craft beer. Maybe they blog. Maybe they just really love craft beer and they're they're out there and they're, they're promoting it uh, and they're wanting to be a part of the industry. 
Someone who is beer literate understands how brewing processes, ingredients, style, and history all are cumulative and how they all work together and how they affect each other. Beer literate, beer literate individuals understand proper serving, glassware, food, and beer pairing, and they have a knowledge of beer history. So why it is important to develop an engaging program? If somebody's at a beer school, you probably think that they just want to be there, right? And since we're all over 21, they should be able to learn from a lecture. But you really want them to return for the next craft beer school. And if it's a boring lecture, they may not. Engaging curriculum addresses different learning styles. Engaged learning brings invested individuals. Um, you know, there's a need for someone to feel like they're an active participant in their education. You know, having an engaging program helps to build culture in your tap room. Uh, and it makes it feel less like that stereotypical work or, or school that someone might remember. So make it not boring. Let's put together an engaging curriculum. There are four basic steps for building a curriculum. The first is you're going to determine your goals and your objectives. The second, you're going to identify your content and your sequence. The third would be to develop your lesson activities and strategies. And the fourth is to do a PDSA or a plan, do, study, act. Your goal and, goals and objectives are basically what you want to accomplish. What are your over, the, the big parts, the big rocks. Uh, you wanna identify your content and content in your sequence secondly, and those are the big ideas that are kind of just below those major pieces of your of your goals and objectives. And you need to figure out how you're going to share them. Uh, when you're developing your lessons and your activities and your strategies, it's in-depth information that you want to present to a variety of learning styles. <clears throat> and when you're PDSAing or plan, do, study, acting, you're evaluating what works and what doesn't work and what you can improve on or what you can add and change. So why do you want your staff or customer, what do you want your staff or customers to be able to accomplish? Examples of some of the goals might be develop a craft beer literate in individuals, embrace the craft beer lifestyle, develop tasting skills or develop palates, um, describe and identify beer styles, understand the craft brewing process. These are all important goals for any program, whether they are a customer or whether they are a staff member. Our goals are based on a craft beer lifestyle. We try to keep our staff meetings out of beer school. We don't want to talk about registers or POS or um, you know cleaning techniques for the tap room. We really want it to be about the craft beer lifestyle. We use beer from other breweries. Um, it's not uncommon for us to go over to the local bottle shop and pick up several different varieties of the same style or just a wide variety for us to sample and kind of work on our, on our um, tasting abilities. We don't make our beer schools mandatory for staff. We want them to feel encouraged and we want them to participate. Um, and we also don't want them to feel like they have to be there. Some of our staff may have gone through some of the training. Some of our staff might want to repeat training. Some staff may never have been there. So it's, it's nice that it's not a mandatory um, option. We want them to develop skills that they can apply elsewhere. We want them to be able to go to another tap room and be able to identify a beer and or talk about a beer based on, on tasting it, not just because of what they know is already on our taps in our, in our tap room. We want to build ambassadors for craft beer, and we want to encourage beer interaction. We want to encourage people to talk about beer. What are they finding? What are they tasting? What's, you know, what's, what's exciting about that for them? Your goals can be specific to your brewery, your beers, and your area. You know, it's, you know, whatever you want your goals to be. Ask yourself, what do you want your staff or your customers to be able to do after a beer school? And then take the time to write it down. Because we're on a shortened time frame, you can do you can start jotting some of that down now, or you can do it later. Or you can go ahead and crack open that beer if you haven't already. What makes a goal smart? A smart goal is something that is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Making your goal smart, we already have a basic goal, but making them smart holds us accountable and makes it a little bit easier for us to, to see if we're actually reaching those goals. For example, those SMART goals will allow you to plan and look at all of the steps needed. They'll help you to set timelines and increase motivation. And your SMART goals increase the chances of achieving your, your goals in general because you're, you're making yourself more accountable. Developing goals into SMART goals. 
One of the goals that we have is to promote craft beer literacy. That's kind of broad for a SMART goal. It's really not specific enough. Neither is embrace the craft beer lifestyle. I mean, we still want our, our customers and our staff to walk away doing those things, but that's hard to actually measure and it's hard to, to get a timeline on. Developing tasting skills, it's a little closer. Identifying beer styles, that's getting even closer. And then understanding the craft brewing process, that's an easier goal to uh, kind of transform into a SMART goal. It's much more specific. So let's take a look at that one. Understanding the craft beer processes and brewing, that's the first goal. To make that into a SMART goal, we would change that language to by the end of the first quarter, 75% of participating individuals will understand the basics of brewing, the brewing process enough to discuss using correct terms with industry and non-industry individuals. This doesn't mean they're going to be able to walk away and brew a beer. It just means that they can have a conversation with someone who is in the industry or out of the industry and legitimately discuss using correct vocabulary, understanding the processes that are happening, and really be able to kind of advocate for craft beer. One of the goals was identify beer styles. If we were going to change that into a SMART goal, it might respond, it might sound like by the end of the first half or by the end of lesson six, participating individuals will be able to identify beer styles with 100% accuracy in a blind tasting of four in-house beers. That's a nice transition for it, but it's also um, a little bit vague. Those four in-house beers, I could have an easier flight or a harder flight. I could do a flight where there's a where there's a stout, a sour, an IPA, and maybe um, a blonde ale. That would be pretty easy to identify those four beers. But if I were to take all beers with the same color palette, um, how about a brown ale, an Irish try, uh, maybe you know two more beers in similar color screen, colors, uh, that would be a little bit more difficult. They would have to truly rely on their palate. So you have to think about where you want to have um, or what that test would look like for that as well. The goal for develop tasting and evaluation skills. By the end of the course, participating individuals will be able to identify, correctly identify flavors and aromas in beer and identify the contributing ingredients with 100% accuracy. By the end of the course, 50% of participating individuals will be able to identify off flavors and identify their sources with 100% accuracy during a blind tasting, meaning we're going to hand them a beer and they're, or four or five beers and ask them to sample them and identify which beer has an off flavor or has a problem, and then to tell us where that problem came from. Does every goal need to be smart? No, but you do need to have some goals to plan. So your content and sequence, you know, what con do you need to, content do you need to have and when do they need to learn it? That's important. Backwards design starts with the end result. So when you're developing your curriculum, you're going to start from the very end. What do you want them to know? Using your SMART goals, identify a list of topics, information, and the order that it's important to learn it in and make it logical. For example, don't teach off flavors until you've covered tasting and style. If they don't know what a brown ale is supposed to taste like, they're not going to know if a brown ale has um, acetaldehyde in it because they really won't know what that flavor should be with should be to begin with. So make sure that they understand that before you begin covering off flavors. Scope and sequence. This is a sample uh, for an example of what um, what it might look like over the course of a year, going from February until next January. And this is actually the one that we're using this year in-house. So we started with tasting and describing beers in February. In March, we uh, did some identifying of beers and we did an introduction to brewing. And then April, we've already had a brew day and we began, began covering um, ingredients a little bit more in depth. Continuing, I'll let you read through these because it's not something I'm, I don't want to read everything to you. Um, but for example, June, we might do sour beers, cider and seltzer. August, we'll cover Oktoberfest and German styles because those are beers that will be coming out if they're not already out by some places. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll do a formal sensory, formal off sensory in November after they've had six or seven months to really take a look at some of the beer styles and experience what those beers are supposed to taste like. Tasting and evaluation skills. By the end of the course, um, 
Participating individuals will be able to correctly identify flavors and aromas in beer and identifying the contributing ingredients with 100% accuracy. That is one of the goals. We are going to take a look at how that looks on uh, how we're covering that over the course of the year. So the scope and sequence of trying to cover that example, we'd be looking at talking about tasting and describing beers almost every single month, incorporating that so they're getting constant revision and constant chances to, to identify taste beers and learn how to do that. That's the highlighted portion. A couple of tips, you can write your content on post-it notes so you can move it around until you're happy. Um, if you're old school like me, if you're not old school and you're, you know, a little more tech savvy, put it in, you know, Google Doc or work on, you know, you know, a different kind of uh, format. Remember to be agile and mobile, move things around if you need to, and to take your time. Work it out over the course of a couple of days or, or a couple of weeks. Trying to, to figure out that scope and sequence doesn't have to happen overnight, doesn't have to happen in one afternoon. You can take your time kind of developing it. All the details and how it's delivered. So when we're talking about lessons and activities and strategies, um, we really need to kind of talk a little bit about lesson planning. But before you do that, before we begin that, take a second to get a sip of your beer, your coffee, or your soda, or water. What makes something engaging? Engagement really depends upon an individual's learning style. There are four different types of learning styles. There's the visual learning style, where individuals prefer diagrams, they prefer to see things drawn out, drawn out concepts, charts, maps, graphs, maybe photographs. Um, that person likes to see images uh, or, or in-person kind of items like a show and tell. Auditory individuals prefer things to be heard or spoken. It's easy for them to go ahead and pull information. They process things a little bit better by listening and then, and then um, processing it. Reading and writing, individuals prefer to look, take a look at words, whether it's written or whether they're reading it. Um, a nice combination of both of those two helps them to remember all of the information just a little bit better. Kinesthetic or physical, those are the individuals that need to learn by doing something hands-on. They need to get their hands dirty or they have to move. Maybe, you know, movement can be something as simple as walking across a room or it can be, you know, shoveling out grain out of a big uh, a mash tun. And the environment can be social or solitary for any of these individuals. Um, some people learn better in a social environment or a noisy environment. You know, think about the people who turn the TV on. Or some people like it to be quiet or solitary or with no one around them so they can really focus on what they're doing. So to increase engagement and participation, you want to mix up these learning styles. You don't want to always come through and do um, just, you know, a, a, uh, a lecture. And you don't want to go through and just do hands-on. And you don't want to go through and just do something where someone has to read everything because it gets boring. And mixing it up allows people to have a little more social interaction and also to ask more questions or, or find new connections as well. Some of the strategies you can use to mix up your education to create or mix up your program to make it a little more engaging is adding in a challenge, making sure there's something to um, stimulate the senses, you know, with sight, see, sight, touch, smell, taste, sound, uh, create opportunities for movement. Make sure there's something to drink. It's a beer school. They should have a beverage in their hand. And make sure there's something to take home or access to extended learning after, after it's all finished. A challenge or a game, this really shouldn't be a test, um, or at least it isn't graded. It should be motivating and fun, and it should have a follow-up. Because some of the examples that we have, and I'll explain what these are, um, is a blind beer tasting. So in March, our students came in, and we sat down a, a, uh, a flight with four beers in it with no information, and they could see the 16 beers that we have on draft. We asked them to identify the four of the 16. All of the beers were brown. All of the beers had a um, darker uh, SRM. So they couldn't really, you know, just, you know, look up and find four dark beers on the board because we actually had probably six or seven on the board at the time. They really had to go through and try to figure out which ones um, were those particular beers. The kind of results on that, it was their very first time. Um, the majority of them actually had 50%. A couple of them got 75% right. And we had one person have 100% correct. They got all four beers. 
it's difficult to go in and pick up a beer, taste it, figure out exactly which beer it is. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was also eye-opening for them and for us because it let us also know a little bit about which staff have a little bit more refined palate and who already had some skills in identifying or already had knowledge of certain beer styles. Build a seasonal six pack challenge. Um, this was probably one of my favorite things that we've done so far to, to kind of start off a lesson. And we handed them a list and said, build a seasonal six pack and you couldn't use any of the beers that we had in house. Why it was important to do that and what it simulated and what it challenged them with was they had to identify six beers that were current, that were available locally. Um, and that's important because when a customer comes in and says, I really want to try this beer by such and such, or they mention a specific style, you want them to be able to have that conversation. You also want, you know, that seasonal six pack challenge. That was hard. It was hard for me and I knew the question, but it was like I said, it was really interesting to see the answers and, and how many people could, could do and who was going out and kind of going to different places, um, bottle shops and who was purchasing beer from home for a home as well. Beer evaluation, uh, they're trying to find high quality beers, also looking to see uh, off flavors. Uh, the pop quiz, give a pop quiz over what you're going to cover that day. Take a few minutes, you know, to if you're going to talk about off flavors, see what they already know. Some of the people might have a lot of knowledge already, and some of them, it's just going to whet their appetite to see what's coming later on um, during the day. Fill in the blank diagrams are a great way to kind of challenge somebody. Um, and a, a great example would be like the parts of a hop. Uh, or, you know, pictures of, of all of your brew equipment or pictures of different types of um, equipment in the brew house and say, label this, give it a name. Um, sometimes they'll remember, sometimes they won't. Sometimes it, it jogs in memory from things that they've already done. Put out a few pieces of beer equipment, put a faucet out and ask them to try to put it together or put a faucet out and try to ask them to take it apart. Um, bingo, trivia and crosswords are great games and there's lots of free versions online that you can do. Challenge your staff to, to name a beer uh, and explain it. Uh, challenge them to design their own label. Or, you know, give them a survey, especially an online survey where they can see the, the final results quickly. Google Forms has some great options for that. You want to do something to make sure that they're engaging all their senses. Um, so if you have a beer, coffee, or something to drink, take a second to sniff that uh, just to kind of activate your, your sense of smell. Uh, individuals who really need to see something, show and tell items, different resources like books, handouts. Those are great things to kind of activate someone who needs to see something or doing a demonstration is another great way or a video. Smell, um, different beer ingredients, actual beers, food items, um, taste, same thing, beer ingredients and food items. Uh, doing a malt sensory with those things is a, is a wonderful way to kind of activate, activate the taste as well. Touch, give them something to write or do with their hands while they're sitting there. And again, show and tell items they can pick up, touch, or work with. Sound, if it's someone who really likes to work with sound or who is um, really does well with lectures, you know, lectures or an active discussion, bring in a guest speaker, share a vlog, share videos, um, maybe have music playing in the background. Opportunities for movement, take them on a field tip to the brewery, walk through, look at all the equipment, show them where everything's at, show them, tell them the names of things, go behind the bar, um, have everybody get switch tables and seats, uh, have them set something up, have them go ahead and get a beer, water, soda, um, have somebody pass items out, have them write or sketch something, um, take a tour or a field trip to someplace else. One of my favorite ways to kind of incorporate movement or getting out or going on a field trip is to go to someplace like um, a maltster or a hop farm. In this case, we went to a hop farm a couple of years ago before COVID. We had the opportunity to really talk to the farmers, to really take a look at the end of the season and to kind of see what was happening um, as far as the, the process from the buying to pelletizing. And then, of course, we went out after and had a few beers that had those particular hops in them to try to see if we could identify the, the smell from the fresh hop to the pint glass. It's a beer school, so give them something to drink. You know, flights, samples, maybe a full pour. Uh, make sure there's water if you're doing full pours. Also, if you're doing beers, um, you know, bring in yours and others. You know, have both. Have, um, you know, a variety of things available. Don't just do your beers. Let them try somebody else's beers. 
access to extended learning, um, let them know where they can find information on their own. Where are resources available? What, you know, resources are the most important to you and share those out with them. Make sure that, you know, anything that's relevant to your brewery, they have access to so that they can, they can find out more on their own or they can share it with other people. Uh, blogs, beer guilds, um, craft beer clubs. If there are specific books, give them a list of books. If there are specific magazines that you feel would be important for them or that, that might benefit them, have them, you know, take a look at the, the different magazines. Uh, newsletters, show them email newsletters, paper newsletters, beer apps. Uh, I'm going to plug one. The Ohio on tap app is fantastic. Um, because, you know, I'm in Ohio and they're wonderful, but it has a lot of great resources that we encourage our staff and our customers to also go and look at and use. So if you don't have the Ohio on tap app, um, maybe install it and take a look at it and see what, what they offer. Online beer schools like the Cicerone program are fantastic because there's all kinds of knowledge that they can do on their own time and, and find on their own and study. So, so let's take a second to look at an entire lesson and how it kind of all looks together. So brewing was, was uh, one of the goals that we looked at earlier. I know that you, we need to know equipment names. We want basic brewing terminology. We want staff to have safety procedures down pat. We want them to understand from grain to glass, you know, what happens when that grain comes in through the entire brewing process, how it goes and how, you know, it gets transformed. We want them to understand the scientific process. And we also want them to understand cleaning and sanitation and the differences between cleaning and sanitation. So some of the things that we might use for that would be like a, a vocabulary list of terminology, um, the written brew process, you know, explaining everything, excuse me, step by step. Uh, maybe a walking tour of the production and storage spaces. Maybe bring in some guest speakers, um, different industry contacts, or field trip to another brewery, or collaboration brew days with other breweries, or just bring in another brewer to have them come in and talk to your staff. But that's a lot of information for one class, so you're going to want to break it down a little bit over multiple classes, which is um, what we did in March and April for the brewing process. So our part one, this was the class description, the course description, or the class description. Uh, it was an in-depth look at the brewing process from prep all the way to the tap. We let the students know that we'd be reviewing what we were going to be working on and reviewing. Um, we wanted to make sure that they knew to have the correct kind of attire. And we also um, knew that we would be in the production facility and the dock. So they wanted to make sure that they had non-slip shoes. And we also let them know that we would be practicing sensory skills. So maybe before coming in, they shouldn't have, you know, a taco or, you know, that double espresso or that triple IPA because they wanted to have those, um, their taste buds ready. So what we started with in March in that first session was a blind beer tasting with all brown beers. Um, and that took about 30 minutes. After we began uh, reviewing the brewing information, uh, brewing terminology, and a summary of, of the entire brewing process in a handout, um, went through questions, talked about what, you know, what the day was kind of like. And then we took a 30 to 40 minute walking tour of the production space, identified the equi equipment, and we walked through from step one all the way to done, just starting at that very beginning where the grain was stored, the process of bringing it up to um, the uh, mash ton, and you know what happened and all of the different steps. Um, our brewer really loved going over all of that information. He loved being able to share the space and to, to answer questions at that time. You know, some of the things that would be a great takeaway for that would have been like suggested videos over the brewing process. We actually just said we'll sign up to do a uh, day where you guys can come in and be a part of the brew process um, and to pick a day that was convenient. Uh, but that's really difficult on timelines. And it's also difficult for someone to maybe take a day off from their other job or, you know, some of the brew, brew, brew days start pretty early or they go pretty late. So we came up with a second day. And this is the part two of brewing knowledge. And we did this in April and we asked our staff to come in and participate in the brew day. And we made it kind of multifaceted and we made it a lot of uh, more enjoyable because it's actually going to be a beer that's going to be released as our anniversary beer. So the staff that wanted to come in that could come in on that Saturday did. We asked them to um, make sure to wear appropriate attire because you have to remind people you don't want flip flops in the brewery. Um, we reminded them, you know, the safety of having pant legs over boot tops. And we also told them that they didn't have to stay for the whole day because a brew day is a long process. 
and that's something that a lot of people don't understand sometimes is, is how long it takes from start to finish. It's not, it's not a cake. It's not done in an hour and a half, but there's a, there's a lot of steps um, and a lot of time involved. So we shared the schedule with them as well. And we began our day with setting up, talking about rules and safety. We did grain in and talked about water analysis. And then there's some downtime, um, which typically our brewers would be doing something else. And they talked about that. We did a very small malt sensory at that time. We just introduced what um, the grains were doing. And we talked about different types of grains. We had three different grains out. We steeped them and let them taste them to see what the flavors were just from steeping. We moved into sparge and laudering, had lunch at the same time, um, moved into grain out and transfer after that, kettle prep additions, uh, a very short hop hop sensory where we were looking at the pellets and kind of crushing those and smelling different types of um, hop pellets to see what the, the different aromas were. We didn't eat any hops, but we did smell them. Uh, and then, you know, moved into Whirlpool, transfer the f fermenter, clean up, and then having a couple of beers after. We made sure that it was really important that our staff understand that consumption of alcohol during the brewing process is a safety concern. And it's something that we can't have any of our staff doing. And then if they're home brewing, they, they probably shouldn't do either. Um, these are a couple of the photos from the brew day. We also had a lot of fun juggling oranges. We had two guests in the brew house for that brew. We also, we had um, the Culligan man of North Central Ohio, who has been working with us on some different uh, RO water techniques. And we also had a representative from Origin Malt uh, who came in and helped to make um, part of the beer, helped to pour in some of the grain, mash in, and was available for questions as well. So when you're planning your classes or your topics and, and what you wanna do, you wanna be also thinking about, can they master the skill or knowledge in one class? And if not, how many classes do you need to really present the information or how can you um, present it? What's the best way to present it? And then what resources do you actually have? And then who are your students? Your staff are going to have probably a different approach than what customers would have. And then you want to repeat that for each lesson if you know that you've already done on your scope and sequence. These are just a few ideas and tips for lessons. Um, you know, you want to encourage peer training or beer training, feed them, um, develop their abilities to master the skills that you're giving them, bring in outside experts, you know, ask what they don't understand and listen to what they're asking. Um, if someone's consistently missing something or someone's not able to taste something, find out why, give them some opportunities or find some, some workarounds for them. Track the data, um, give them resources that are digital and physical, Use what's available to you. You don't have to have an expensive beer school, but you can certainly spend as much money as you want. Make it voluntary and then, you know, smile. Um, so what worked and what didn't? Um, plan, do, and study act is something that I think we all do in a lot of different uh, businesses. Um, we do this and um, and we did this when I taught. It's something where you just take a second to, to decide what worked, what do you want to keep, how do you fix it, and how do you adjust it. Ask yourself what went right, what went wrong. Ask for feedback. Reevaluate your goals. You can change your goals. Adjust them as needed and then ask for ideas. It doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be, uh, you know, set in stone, you can always change anything and you can adjust everything, you know, based on the feedback that you get from your staff as well. So, yeah. If you're looking for different things, if you have questions, um, if you need ideas or if you, you know, want to see what our processes are, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, my email is red at phoenixbrewing.com. And uh, thank you for coming. And thank you again to Andrew and the Crafty Professionals team for, um, for setting up the entire spring conference. Uh, thanks. I'll give it a second, see if there's any questions in the comments. Again, feel free to message at red at phoenixbrew.com. I'd be happy to share any and all of our resources with you. Um, so just shoot me an email. Thank you.
I'm not seeing um, a whole lot of questions. So like I said, if you have any questions at all, feel free to email me and have a fabulous week. Thanks, everybody.